Today in Hosea chapter 8, we are in the midst of a series of messages on God's incomparable love. God's incomparable love. God loves us so deeply. God loves the children of Israel. He loves each one and he loves and he is trying to see the children of Israel to repent, to turn away from their idolatry back to him. And you know, as we read this, today's message is reaping the whirlwind. In, in Hosea chapter 8, verses 1 to 14, the first point on your outline is predicted invasion. A predicted invasion. The Lord had been saying they were going to be carried into captivity. That they would be carried away from their homeland and the Assyrians are coming. It's going to happen just like God said. You know, back in the book of Deuteronomy, God gave a choice to the children of Israel. The choice was, you can either uh, follow me, be my people, and experience the blessings, but if you choose to turn away from me, remember we saw in Jeremiah the fountain of living waters, the source of life, if you turn away from me and turn to idols and go your own way, Here's what's going to happen. God laid it out. All the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, he made it clear this is what's going to happen. So guess what? What Hosea is saying is just what has been stated before, and it's now being carried out because God does keep his word. And there's a point in time where God says that's enough. God is merciful. He is compassionate. He is forgiving. But he is righteous and he is just, and he will keep his word. And so we're going to see in Hosea chapter 8 the severity of the attack. In verse 1, put the trumpet to your lips. Now, today, when there's an emergency, we have a siren. You know, there's a, a storm, there's a, a tornado warning out there. What happens? There are the sirens saying, take cover and, and go to the secure place. There's a storm coming, a severe time and, or uh, an emergency. We even have on our radios and TVs, you hear that loud noise and it says important information following the emergency broadcast system. And uh, every once in a while, there's a test of that. And, and, you know, they, they have to be careful not to test when it's uh, bad weather and, and that would be a time of regular alarm. But the reality is, it's a way to say, get ready. So Hosea the prophet says, put the trumpet to your lips. O watchman, get ready to sound forth the trumpet because there is a severe attack on the way. And that would be the Assyrians to carry them away to the northern captivity, the, the northern tribes to the Assyrian captivity. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord. The swiftness of the attack, the picture of an eagle swooping down. And that is how quickly that the invasion of the Assyrians would be coming the swiftness of the attack, the sins against God. We're told in, in this verse, because they have transgressed my covenant. Spiritus Odiades and his lexical aids to the Old Testament said spiritually when men move outside the requirements of the covenant by committing sin, they transgress. A, a transgression against God. They have transgressed against me, against my covenant, and rebelled against my law. In verse 3, Israel has rejected the good. The enemy will pursue him. They have rejected what is good. And the enemy is going to pursue When we think about 
point D, what they are guilty of is continuing to cry out and pretending in worship, but they're still sinning against God. They're trying to put together saying we belong to God, we are his people, but we're going to continue to worship Baal and these various gods and mix that worship. And this syncretism of putting it together and mixing this, but God says, I alone am, I'm the Lord and there, there is no other. I will not share that worship with those that are so-called gods. But this is what they're trying to do. Verse 2, they cry out to me, my God, we of Israel know you. My God, we are your children. We are your people. We know you. But what does the word say? Israel has rejected the good, the enemy will pursue him. So they're pretending to worship. David Levy in his article, his ongoing study from 2001 on this book of Hosea, he wrote, in essence, the nation was saying, we are your people, God, so deliver us from the coming judgment. Yet Israel's immorality and idolatry proved, in fact, that she neither knew the Lord nor desired to practice God's law. This isn't new. Take your Bibles and go back to Exodus chapter 32, please. Exodus 32. You may remember that Moses is up with the Lord on Mount Sinai. Aaron has been left with the people, the children of Israel. In Exodus chapter 32, it's a very sad scripture, but we have a picture here of what Israel is doing at the time of Hosea and as he is prophesying. This is at the beginning. God has delivered them from bondage, from being 430 years as slaves in Egypt. He has brought them out of slavery. He has led them through the Red Sea. When Pharaoh and his army came after them and they're like, what are we gonna do? Here's the Red Sea before us and here is Pharaoh and his army coming after us and they said, why did we let them go? We don't wanna let them go. And they were caught truly between a rock and a hard place. They're like, what are we gonna do? And they're crying out. And what's the Lord do? He makes a path right through the middle of the Red Sea. God miraculously led them and provided and did this. And soon afterwards, what are they going to do? Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, oh, we would like to ask Aaron, why did you ever say this to them? Why didn't you call out to them and say, what are you saying? Make us of a God. The true God has just brought us out. Let's worship him. But what's Aaron do? Aaron says, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in the ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. He took this, took a graving tool, and formed and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel. What did they do? They replaced Yahweh 
the I am who I am, who has led them out of bondage, who has delivered them, the true God, to worship a, molten, a, a, a golden calf that has been made. And they said, this is your God. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. No, it isn't. Now, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. What do you do with an altar? This is for worship. So they are going to build an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Did you catch that? Tomorrow is a feast to who? All capital letters. To the true God, to the great I am who has delivered us. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. But they have an altar that has been made now before a molten golden calf. So the next day, they rose early and offered burnt offerings. They were used to doing, when we think later on, you're going to see in the law, they're going to be offering burnt offerings to the Lord, but not here. They're offering burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. That's a way of saying their sexual immorality. Worship. Not of the true God. But it was a feast unto the Lord. You see what they did? We have a feast of the Lord. But this is the way we're going to do it. That's exactly what Israel is doing again. That's exactly. And this is why God says, that's enough. I have sent prophet after prophet to them, and I have sent them the message to repent, to turn away from this sin and turn back to me. And they will not do it. Did they have a choice? You better believe it. But what are they doing? So we have here, now we have the pronouncement of iniquity, verses 4 through 11. They have set up kings, but not by me. They haven't bothered to consult me. They haven't checked with me. They have set up their own kings. They have chosen men on their own. Civil rebellion. They've appointed princes, but I did not know it. And then there's corrupt religious system. With their silver and gold, they have made idol for themselves. Isaiah would describe these idols that they have ears, but they cannot hear. They have eyes, but they cannot, they cannot see. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They've been formed. They've been made. And they're bowing before these made idols. Friend, we worship the Creator. <laughs> we worship Almighty God who made us and who made everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All belongs unto Him. He is the Maker. They are bowing down. They might be cut off. Verse 5, he has rejected your calf, O Samaria, saying, my anger burns against them. We saw in Exodus a molten calf. Guess what? They're going to go back and try that again. Corrupt religious system. 
David Levy wrote that she had amassed gold and silver to construct golden calves and silver idols in Bethel and Dan and had instituted Baal worship, a direct violation of the second commandment. Verse 5, my anger burns against them. He has rejected your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of innocence? For from Israel is even this. A craftsman made it so it is not God. Surely the calf of Samaria will be broken to pieces. For they sow the wind. That phrase, sowing the wind, they... It's the idea of futility and fickleness. They sow the wind, but this is where we get the title for this message. Notice, they reap the whirlwind. They sow to the wind, but they're going to reap the devastation that comes from a terrible storm. The whirlwind. Israel's idolatry and foreign policy would result in a whirlwind of destruction from the Assyrian army. The Bible says, the standing grain has no heads, it yields no grain. Should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. All the, the fields that have been planted another people will come in and harvest it. Israel will not harvest. Israel will not eat of the produce. Then we see a compromising relationship. Verses 8 through 10, Israel is swallowed up. They are now among the nations like a vessel in which no one delights. No one is saying, oh, there's mighty Israel. No one is looking at them and saying, oh, look at, at their strength. They're seen as just mocked. Look at those people. Look at them. They're just like the other nations. And the Bible says, they're now among the nations like a vessel in which no one delights, for they have gone up to Assyria. Like a wild donkey all alone, Ephraim has hired lovers. Before the Assyrian captivity, they went to Assyria, and they went to Assyria and said, you know, we'll become, we'll pay tribute to you. We will hire you to protect us. They not only did that with Assyria, they did that with others. Ephraim has hired lovers. Even though they hire allies among the nations, now I will gather them up and they will begin to diminish because of the burden of the king of princes. Even though they have trusted in these other nations, they haven't looked to me. They chose these relationships they're going to face a sudden destruction and judgment. But even in the midst of this, you have people's indifference. Verses 11 to 14, you have, first of all, hypocritical ritualism. Since Ephraim has multiplied altars for sin, they have become altars of sinning for him. Though I wrote for him 10,000 precepts of my law, they are regarded as a strange thing. As for my sacrificial gifts, they sacrifice the flesh and eat it, but the Lord has taken no delight in them. You are continuing to offer these sacrifices, and you know what? I am turned away. This does not delight me because there's no obedience. There is no heart for me. You are just going through the motions. Do you realize that in conservative evangelical churches, there can be people that get caught up in mere ritualism? Going through the motions, but no life. 
no heart. Even still reading the Bible. You might say, well, I, I read the Bible today, check that off. Or I've prayed, I prayed before my meals, I prayed at night and said, Lord, would you forgive me of my sins and, and, and check that off. But have no life, no vibrancy. That happens. It happens in the United States of America. And to be honest with you, it, it can even happen with you over a period of time. It was happening with Israel. They're, they're saying, we're offering the sacrifices, Lord. We are your people. But they would not depart from the idolatry and the wickedness. They ignored the law. They were offering the sacrifices, but the Lord had no delight in them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish them for their sins. They will return to Egypt. Remember what we said about Egypt? What were they in Egypt? Slaves. Instead of Egypt this time, guess what? They're going to be carried into captivity. They will not have their freedom. They're going to be taken captive. The Assyrian captivity, 722 B.C., that will take place. And that's exactly what God said in Deuteronomy would happen. When they chose to turn away from him and worship other gods. And place your trust. And you, you turn to these nations to help you. To, to help you militarily. Instead of turning to me. I want you to notice verse 14. We read this, and the Bible says, For Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces. And Judah has multiplied fortified cities. But I will send a fire on its cities that it may consume its palatial dwellings. So we ask the question, point B, how do men mislay God? We use that word mislay for this reason. When we see that phrase, Israel has forgotten his maker. G. Campbell Morgan on his commentary on the book of Hosea, The Heart and Holiness of God, he wrote the following about the Hebrew word used for forgotten, that it literally means to mislay. People say, how can you forget God? You ever mislay something? Maybe you need your keys. I put them somewhere. I tell you what I do is I write a reminder for myself and then forget where I put the reminder. <laughs> what good is that? I wrote it down. I just don't know where I put it once I wrote it down. Mislaid. They mislaid God. They had forgotten Him. The Hebrew idea of to mislay. God warned about this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 to 20. God was preparing them as they're going to go into the promised land, into the land of milk and honey there is plenty. No more manna when you get into that promised land. But God said in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 8, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. 
when you go into that land of plenty and everything's multiplying, everything is prospering, then you will forget me. God gave a warning, didn't he? Guess what happened? They would go into the land. They would have plenty. They became proud and said, look what we've accomplished. Look what we have achieved. And they turned away from Almighty God. Started worshiping Baal. Starting worshiping other gods instead of the true God. Verse 17, otherwise you may see in your heart my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you today that you will surely perish like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish because you would not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Throughout the scriptures, God gave them warnings. He gave a clear statement. This is what will happen if you turn away from me and start worshiping other gods. No one there could say, God didn't warn us. He didn't give us chances to repent. But they failed to listen. They forgot God. Forgetting is personal neglect of the things that are intellectually believed and failure to make them the central things of family life. We have to be careful. We can intellectually believe something but not really practice it. How many here wholeheartedly believe and know that God is in control? We can say that God is sovereign. But here's the real question. And friend, it's convicting for me to ask this question, do I always act like it? I can say with my lips, I can sing heartily, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and, and, and crown him Lord of all. But what am I doing when I am sinning against God and I am worrying instead of praying about something to him? Am I acting? as if I really believe and know that God is in control? I can say God is all powerful. But do I always act as if he is? God is all knowing. But do I always act as if he is? God is saying here, Intellectually, they knew some things. When we looked in Exodus 32, what did they know? Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. But did they act like it? They were worshiping that golden calf. They set up the altars to the golden calf. They were celebrating a feast to the Lord, but not unto the Lord. They had understanding, but they didn't carry that out in their practice. Forgetting personal, is personal neglect of the things that are intellectually believed and failure to make them the central things of family life. Israel has mislaid God in its individual action, in its national outlook, and in its dealing with its children. The purpose of these feasts, we're worshiping the Lord, but also to teach the further generations and say, why are we doing this? Why are we celebrating the Passover? Why are we celebrating uh, the uh, 
Feast of Tabernacles. What happened? What is this doing? What's the purpose? And the Lord established these so that they would teach the, the new generations coming up and explain to them and say, this is what God did, and this is who he is, and this is why we are worshiping him, because he is a great and awesome God. But what happened? They stopped doing that. True security comes from the Creator, but God's people trusted instead in their own efforts, symbolized by their temples and fortified cities. When we think about that danger of how do men mislay God, G. Campbell Morgan wrote, what is the process? How do men come to mislay God? First, they give an intellectual assent to the fact of his existence without seeing to it that their conduct corresponds with their assent. An intellectual orthodoxy will blast a man as surely as heresy will, unless there is the action in life that corresponds with the accurate assent of the mind to truth. That was the story of this nation. And whenever there is intellectual assent without corresponding action, there is spiritual dullness. God intellectually accepted without response and obedience fades away from the immediateness of, immediateness of consciousness. He is relegated. It may be to the temple and left there, is relegated. It may be to the church on Sunday and is left there until we get back next Sunday. God is mislaid. He is lost. That was the trouble with Israel. It's the trouble with humanity. God forgotten in that sense, mislaid, lost as an act of power, touching life, conditioning it, inspiring it, driving it, building it up. Israel hath forgotten his maker. Well, what, when then that is so, what happens next? Hosea said Israel was building. Now, if we are looking at the old version, it says temples. The revised version says palaces. They are both right. I think either word may be used to convey the sense of the Hebrew word. The word that the prophet made use of literally means spacious buildings. The old translator said that means temples. The new translators say it means palaces. It may mean either. It may mean both. The true idea is that of spaciousness. Whether that spaciousness was for pleasure or for worship matters nothing. The passion of the nation came to be to build big things. Somebody says these prophets are out of date. Think again. The passion for bigness is a symptom of capacity for the eternal, for God. And when men have mislaid God, when they try and build big things without God, men are ever striving to put back the prison walls and to build something larger, more spacious. It is manifest supremely today on the material level, for all material activity is the symptom of mental and spiritual condition. Mislaid God. How do men mislay? It's not the idea so much of forgetting everything, the idea, but priority. Putting him aside to go my own way. Agenda. Before the invitation, I'm constantly reminded as I go back and read those seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 when Jesus writes to five of those seven churches he said to them repent which means they were going in the wrong direction which means they had to have a change of thinking that led to a different action a change of direction one of those churches the Apostle Paul would commend for their love Love for God and love for one another. The church of Ephesus. About 30 some years later, the Lord Jesus would write the letter to the church of Ephesus. You're doing a lot of things right. You're able to discern false teachers. You're able to tell those that are coming in with this false doctrine. 
You're able to, you're, you're busy, you're doing. You're doing all these things. Boy, when they first hear that letter, they probably had their chest puffed out a little bit and said, boy, I'm glad Jesus noticed. Look how great we're doing. But verse 4 starts with an important word. But. But this I have against you. Friend, they were a church that had orthodoxy. They understood correct doctrine. Correct teaching. But this I have against you. You have left your first love. You know what Jesus is saying to them? You have correct teaching, but you have left me. And here's the sad thing. Did they know it? Did they know it until Jesus said to them, you're guilty of this? Friend, you know what happened? They mislaid God. You have left me the first love. And it was so serious. That was their passion, their devotion, their zeal for the Lord. They left. And it was so serious, the Lord said, unless you repent, I will come and remove your lampstand. You'll stop having a testimony that you're even a church unless you repent. Were these guys saved? Was this true? Yes. These were people that knew the Lord Jesus Christ. But they lost their zeal and their passion. They mislaid God. They had orthodoxy. They knew doctrine. They could detect false doctrine. But they didn't have the life, the zeal, the passion that they once had. Maybe you're here today and the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Just as God spoke through the prophet Hosea to the children of Israel to say, you have mislaid me. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? as we have an invitation today. If the Lord's speaking to you, will you respond to him? You have a choice. When he shows you a need, you have a choice. You can either obey and respond to him or ignore him. But he wants you to obey him. First of all, do you know him as your Lord and Savior? You may know intellectually. You may know the facts that Jesus came to this cross, that came to this earth to go to the cross to die for our sins. And he was buried. And he rose again just like he said he would. But have you ever placed your trust in him, saying, it was my sins, Lord Jesus, that you took my sins. You died for me. It was for me you went to that cross. It was for me that you cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because the wrath poured out against sin, you were drinking that cup for me. You rose again. I see that I need you. I am guilty of sin, and I choose to call out to you. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We were talking about this in Sunday school a little bit that said, the Philippian jailer said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Maybe you're here today and you say, I have the I know, I've heard many times what Jesus did, but I've never placed my trust into him. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart. That's called conviction, causing you to see. But today I want to call out to him to be saved.
with your heads bowed. You know, maybe there's somebody here that says the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart right now about my need for salvation, that I need to personally call out to Jesus to come into my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and put it back down? I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Maybe you're here today as a believer and say, you know, the Holy Spirit is speaking to my heart that maybe I have mislaid God. I'm, I'm still reading the Bible. I'm still praying. I'm still coming to church, Sunday school. I may even be serving in various areas. But maybe just like the church of Ephesus, the Lord would say, you have orthodoxy. You know the truth. But you have left your first love. Somebody here is a believer say, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me right now about that. Please pray for me. Heavenly Father, we ask right now in this invitation, again, if there's somebody here that doesn't know you, that even this day they would come to you, Lord, believe in you and to be saved. We pray for the believers. Maybe that don't have that zeal, that love for you that they once did. Oh, dear Lord, I pray that they would respond to you in this invitation. Help them not to say some other time, some other day, but now. When you have showed them this, that they would not just put this off, but right now respond to you. And Lord, an opportunity publicly to respond, to say, I want other believers to pray for me. They may not know everything going on, but they can lift me up to you, Lord, in prayer. As you have said in the body of believers, we're to pray for one another. Lord, whatever that decision that's needed, we ask in this invitation time, just give the boldness we ask. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.